everybody. Um, this is the four o'clock talk in room two, linguistic hacking. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Martin Haas. Um, just one thing, does anybody have a seat that is open next to them that any of the people that are in the aisles could sit in? If you have a seat open next to you, just raise your hand. There's one right here. Yeah, keep your hand up if you have a seat open next to you. We've got two down in front here and one over here. Any seats open or free in the back? Okay, great. Um, when it's time for questions, we'll have a microphone. We'll be, uh, me and one of the audiovisual angels will be each one on each end of the room. So if you're in the aisle, if, if we're coming back to get somebody with a question, if you can just move over so we can get through, that'd be great. And without any further ado, Martin Haas, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you see my email address and my Jabba account on the first slide. So if you're watching this on a video recording or if you cannot uh, get hold of the microphone in the end, please make comments. Please do contact me. And here is some way to, to get in touch with me. So I want to speak about yeah, how to know what a text is about in an unknown language which means in an unknown language to you or to me, not in a generally unknown language. This is a different topic which I can address perhaps next year in two years or at ICMP in summer, um, which is another camp, a smaller camp. But here it's about languages that somebody knows something about. Um, so, um, well, how to identify the language of a written text First of all, I will show traditional, traditional ways to do so, and then, of course, how to do it with the, help, with the help of computer technology. And the second part is about the question how to get at least some information out of an unknown text in an unknown language, in a language unknown to you. So the first question that comes up is what does it have to do with hacking? Well, I take a general definition of hacking, which I've taken from Eric Raymond's dictionary. It's the intellectual challenge of creatively overcoming and circumventing limitations. And we have a big limitations. We don't, we don't know 6,000 languages. And uh, well, sometimes we want to know what is there in a text in a language we don't know. And first of all, people say, well, that's impossible. We need a translator. We need a specialist. But I hope to show you that it is possible to get at least some insight in the first place in order to decide whether a translator is really needed or whether the text is totally uninteresting. So it is, I think it is important to make such a decision uh, before you get in contact with your translation department. Um, why don't I speak about spoken texts? Um, it is possible to do the same thing with, with spoken texts. There, there are approaches um, which work on a multi-language multi corpus of telephone calls. People have uh, <coughs> found ways to identify spoken texts too, but uh, the strategies are somewhat different and I won't address them in my talk here. So I will stick to written languages and the first thing, of course, is the writing system. Um, you get a text in a writing system, and if you are unfortunate, you get a text in Roman script. That's bad, because thousands of languages use Roman scripts, and those who usually don't use Roman scripts have a Roman transliteration system as well, so the text can be literally from thousands of languages. It gets better when you have a text in Cyrillic script because there are more or less, well, there are more than 60 languages, which is a lot, but uh, well, it's less than, uh, than thousands. With Arabic, it's even better. With uh, Devanagari script, I will show uh, to you what that is later. It's only more than 10 languages that use that script. With Hebrew script, it's even less. And if it is another script, let's say Armenian script or Georgian script, 
Well, there's just one language. So if you see the script with the writing system, you know what language it is. And lots of systems of uh, identifying languages uh, use that uh, fact. So they uh, try to find out what writing system that is, and then they know what language it is. They can be wrong, of course. I tested some programs that um, <clears throat> I will mention later, and I just typed some random Korean signs, and the uh, program told me that the language was Korean. It wasn't Korean because I just uh, yeah, typed random signs. Yeah, <clears throat> so that is often used, and it's an easy way to get to, uh, to identify uh, languages. So I mentioned Devanagari. Here you have an idea what that looks like. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a syllabic script used for uh, languages of India and Nepal. And uh, you can easily identify at least the script and perhaps languages with the, with the help of some books. Uh, there is, for example, um, a book by Carl Faulman from the 19th century, and there are such lists, and you, you, you can see, well, you can uh, <coughs> browse through the book and find your script, and then you know, well, that must be Devanagari, and then uh, underneath there's a table with the languages that use Devanagari, and you get to it. The drawback of that book is that it doesn't have sample texts, which would be helpful to really identify the language. Um, but it has a great advantage because Faulman was a, a typographer and he was interested in variants of scripts, so you get different uh, fonts for each script in the book and that makes life easy. So here's another font. Or you use the internet, there is a page called Omniglot, uh, which contains tables of scripts and sample text, and it explains to you how a script works. So here you see how Devanagari works. Um, there is uh, <clears throat> one sign uh, stands for a certain syllable. For example, the first one is pa, and then you can modify the vowel by modifying the sign. You add modifiers for a long R, that's the, the, the signs in red, or for E, for long E, and so, uh, for I, for long I, and so on. Yeah, or you use another book, uh, which is uh, in my bio uh, bibliography, uh, that's uh, a book by uh, Daniels and another author, um, which contains tables of very many different scripts, uh, writing systems, with sample text. So here's an example uh, text of Armenian, and that helps a lot because then you can really uh, identify a language because well, when you just have a table of Devanagari signs, you don't know whether this is a Hindi or Nepali or so, but with the help of the sample text, it gets more easy. So uh, this book is really helpful. I used that. Uh, when I studied linguistics, which was before uh, we had the internet, so it worked. <laughs> yeah, there was a time before internet. Now, there are some problems, some classical problems. For example, if you want to uh, identify a language in Hebrew script, so that there aren't that many, these are the usual uh, languages you find in Hebrew, and if you don't know uh, uh, the Hebrew writing system, it's difficult to uh, know uh, what language that, uh, which language the text um, is written in. But of course, um, you can, uh, well, there are hints uh, what language it is. For example, um, here you have uh, a text in biblical Hebrew, and you can uh, recognize that rather easily, even without uh, knowing the writing system, because you don't have any Western uh, punctuation signs in it. They have strange punctuation signs like this one or that one. And yeah, that shows you that uh, this is probably not modern Hebrew and not Yiddish or uh, Ladino or something like that. Uh, and here you have uh, the same text in Yiddish, the beginning of the Bible. 
And uh, you see you have uh, ar <coughs> Arabic numbers, you have uh, Western punctuation signs. Of course, you find the same thing in Hebrew too, but uh, um, <coughs> if, if you don't learn the, the signs, uh, if you compare a Hebrew and Yiddish texts uh, for, let's say, five minutes, uh, you get used to uh, um, the aspect, so um, Yiddish texts normally look more, um, uh, well, the, the words uh, change quite a lot. There are long words and short words, and uh, some uh, short words always uh, come back. For example, the articles here, D or Dem, so uh, that makes it quite uh, easy to, to uh, uh, to identify Yiddish. And of course, there are special diacritics, so uh, uh, vowel signs in Yiddish, but they are not always written. If you take a text from the Yiddish Wikipedia, you don't uh, see uh, these vowel signs, so that makes it difficult. But it's, it's not so uh, bad. Now, let's say you have a text in uh, uh, Roman script, in Roman writing system. Uh, systems, so that gets uh, you into trouble because <laughs> there are so many languages. And it uh, used to be a problem, especially for uh, li librarians who had to identify what language a book is written in, and they used uh, tables like this table, which was uh, published by Engel in 1980, and um, well, they, they looked up combinations of letters. And then there, there, there's a list of languages where these combinations uh, turn up. Uh, in some cases, it's rather easy. Uh, for example, take, take uh, um, this combination, so there's only one language. Number two, it's Esperanto, so that's easy. But uh, for very many combinations, there are a great number of languages, and you have to check several combinations. I tried that. And at least for the 60 languages uh, in that list, mainly European languages, it is quite easy to uh, identify the language. So here you see it, little an excerpt from that text. Yeah, now we come to computer-aided identification. Um, of course, you can do the same thing uh, with the computer. You can uh, count frequencies of unique characters and of character strings. Uh, this is a method that uh, is widely used in cryptanalysis, and it can be used to identify languages. Another approach is common words uh, recognition, um, which uh, is a method based on word frequency lists, which are generated from sample texts. And uh, the text can be uh, analyzed word by word and compared to the list of, let's say, the top uh, 100 words uh, in the frequency list. Um, can take time and so on. There's another approach which is, even, uh, which is used more often and is used in almost all the web applications that I found uh, <clears throat> on the internet. That is n-gram analysis. So uh, this analysis cuts the text into uh, uh, <clears throat> sequences of one or two or three items. So let's say our text is text. So in n-gram analysis, this uh, is um, <clears throat> transformed. This is uh, uh, yeah transformed into such sequences. So uh, this is a blank sign te. Then you have uh, text, and then ext, and xt, and the blank sign. So this is, um, <clears throat> these are triples, and you can, well, n, n gram means that you can well, analyze three, four, five such, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, sequences, like grams, so to speak. So anyway, it's always the same method. You uh, have a, a sample corpus, language corpus, you generate your models, and uh, then you have the language models, and you compare your documents to these language models. You have the input document, you generate a model from the input uh, 
document, then you compare the two, you can classify them.